introduction about uh, Dr. Devaji Benerjee. Uh, he is a Dean of Academic Affairs at the University of Philosophical Research in Los Angeles, as well as Executive Director of the Nalanda International. And in addition, he is an adjunct faculty at uh, Pasadena City College and a Research Fellow of Asian and Comparative Studies at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Benerjee completed his uh, PhD in Indian art history from the UCLA. Uh, before that, uh, he had a uh, switch of career. Normally, he can go from other parts to engineering or finance or something, but he moved from engineering into art history. Uh, very, uh, very inspiring move uh, in, in that sense. Uh, prior to that, he completed a master's degree in computer science from the University of Louisville at Kentucky, as well as an undergrad uh, degree from the University of Bombay. So today his talk is going to be on uh, Sri Aurobindo, his uh, traditional roots and the new contributions of Sri Aurobindo's yoga practice. Uh, he has authored, uh, authored uh, uh, at least three books and several publications. We have some samples in the back, uh, so please uh, test them out. So please welcome Dr. Devakish Bhattacharya. Thank you so very much, Rama and uh, Dr. Vinod Ambasa, who has uh, invited me for this uh, Bharatiya Vichar Manch meeting. <clears throat> and uh, I've attended a few of their meetings. They were always inspiring and always uh, thought-provoking. Uh, they're usually held at the Saritos Library, but Perhaps it's a higher dispensation that has uh, made this happen today at the Sanatan Dharma Mandir because uh, Sanatan Dharma is uh, something that is almost central to Sri Aurobindo's message. Question is, you know, one of the important things is how he understood Sanatan Dharma. <clears throat> so, as already introduced, my talk today is going to focus on the traditional roots of Sri Aurobindo's sadhana and his special contributions. <clears throat> now, usually when we read Sri Aurobindo, he has written a number of books. They were all written during the period 1910 to 1920. During that period, all his works were written. <clears throat> uh, they are very universal and they are purposely pitched in, a, in such a way, the Indian background in it is Vedantic. There is a constant reference to Upanishads and Gita, and otherwise they are extremely non-denominational. This has allowed him to become a universal figure today. But at the time when Sri Aurobindo was writing his major works, he was also practicing his own sadhana in a very intense way. And what we see here is, is how he looked at that time. This picture was taken around 1920. It's, it's a very intense period in Sri Aurobindo's own yoga sadhana. And he was writing his diaries. So from around 1912 to 1920, he was writing diaries. These diaries have now, now come out. They are called Record of Yoga. And at the same time, he was writing his other works, which the works that I'm talking about, his work on yoga is called Synthesis of Yoga. His work on philosophy is called The Life Divine. These books were being written at the same time. If you read all these side by side, you see that he was actually using very different kinds of language to talk about the same thing. It was almost like not only was he a master of many languages, he, you know, I'm talking about spoken and written languages, but he was a master of a number of ways of addressing people, languages in that sense, and that's what we find in all these works. Now, my talk today is going to focus on the period before this period that I'm talking about. Uh, I have written a book based on Sri Aurobindo's diaries. Uh, this is the book. <coughs> if any of you are interested in this book, it was published this year, early this year, by Nalanda International and DK Print World. It's on his diary, Seven Quartets of Becoming. 
I uh, encourage you to go to the Nalanda International website from where you can buy this book in, in case you're interested. <clears throat> but as I said, what I want to talk about today is what got him there. And so we're going to look at Sri Aurobindo's journey, his, his spiritual journey, his yoga journey, to see what are the various roots, Indian traditional roots that fed into that journey and where he took it. And then we're going to look at what are the special contributions of Sri Aurobindo to Indian spirituality and to, to the world in a sense. Can we move to the next image? So, Sri Aurobindo's spiritual journey can be said to begin when he returned to India. He, as you may know, he spent his childhood in England. He was brought up in England, in London, and later went to Cambridge University for his bachelor's. Uh, he did what, what is called a tripos in the classics. This subject of field, study in the classics, is a vanishing breed of discipline. It is still there in certain uh, universities, but we find that, you know, gradually people are not really giving it that kind of importance that it had at that time. Classics at that time meant the study of Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit, and the languages and literatures, which are today called Indo-European, so looking at that entire tradition. So he was very well versed in the classical languages. And he was also very well versed in European languages, like, of course, English aside, French, Italian, German, and a little bit of Russian as well. Now, he came back in 1893. It's a very, very significant year because as you know, that's the year of the Parliament of World, World Religions. It's two great journeys taking place, one from India to the West, which is Vivekananda's journey to America, and one from the West back to India, that is Sri Aurobindo traveling from England to Baroda. And he came, went to, into the service of the Maharaja of Baroda, who had come to England and employed him, to work in his administration. So Sri Aurobindo went back in 1893 and worked in the Baroda government and then in Baroda University, the university there. And he taught first French, then English, and finally became the vice principal of Baroda College. Uh, it's this time, at this time, he really, though he already had been introduced to Sanskrit in England, he really delved into the Sanskrit tradition when he came to Baroda. And th at this time, he really took up two texts that were to last with him for the rest of his life, uh, life-sustaining texts, and they were the Upanishads and the Gita. So this is his introduction to these two major sacred traditions of India. From the Upanishads, very early he got the idea of these texts as texts talking about moksha or liberation. And from the Gita, he got this notion of karma yoga through a surrender to the Godhead. At one level, Sri Aurobindo was never comfortable with the idea of a moksha, which was world negating something that took him outside the world. He wanted something that allowed a spiritual life inside the world, in the world. And the Gita gave him that doctrine of, 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 of surrender and a, uh, work, uh, and, a, and a spirituality in works. Next, please. Now, in Baroda itself, he also started entering into the freedom struggle. So, very early, this is early phase, 1893 to 1905, very early phase of the struggle for independence. At that time, it was being carried out largely by what today we call the moderates. These people wanted, they, many of them were from Bombay, some of them were from Calcutta as well, and they wanted a 
not freedom for the nation. They wanted what is called constitutional change. In other words, they thought that the British were oppressing the Indians, but the British were fair-minded people, and what was necessary was to push them so that they gave more um, freedom, more allowances, uh, a better treatment to Indians. This was the approach of the moderates. But already a new voice was beginning to be heard, and this was coming from people like Bal Gangadhar Tilak, who Sri Aurobindo met very quickly after he came to Baroda. And they were talking about freedom. They were not asking for Purna Swaraj, not asking for freedom because India was being oppressed by the British. They were asking for freedom for the right of India as a cultural entity to express itself. That we had our own history, we had our own Swadharma, it was one of the words they used. And that needed its own expression. And so long as alien rule was there, that couldn't find its true voice. That's the reason that India needed freedom. This was the ground on which they were asking for freedom. So Sri Aurobindo, when he was in Baroda, started uh, writing a series of articles uh, for a paper in, in Bombay. Uh, Indu Prakash was the name of the paper. The articles were very fiery and the editor came to him and said that it's better you don't write these articles because we'll be caught for sedition. And he stopped writing, he wasn't interested in diluting the message, so he stopped writing those articles. But at the same time, he started connecting with certain broken revolutionary groups in Calcutta. Calcutta already was in the middle of a long period for about a hundred years before that. We've had almost a century or at least 50 or 60 years of nationalist thinking, cultural nationalism going on in Calcutta at that time. And one of these things that were happening there was a slow movement towards revolutionary activity. So small groups had already started planning revolution over there. He contacted these groups and sent people to organize them. In 1905, there was a very famous incident, for those who know anything about history of, of that period, it's called the Partition of Bengal. Of course, history renews itself, and today we see the real partition of Bengal and of India as well. But the, but the first step towards that was taken when for political reasons the administration, British administration, split the province of Bengal and made different kinds of majority uh, equations. It was a political ploy and percentages. And what happened immediately is that there was a big hue and cry and this cultural nationalism that was just waiting to explode got its chance. And Sri Aurobindo himself moved to Calcutta to spearhead the movement which was going to ask for complete freedom and use two kinds of methods. This is very important and interesting. That the whole Swadeshi movement was premised on two two-pronged uh, movement. One was passive resistance for the masses that we will resist uh, British rule we will boycott foreign uh, you know, goods and we will create what is Swadeshi, we will create our own produce. That was one side and the other was uh, the, a planned insurrection, in other, other words a revolutionary movement that could also be violent, terrorist action. So a non-violent and a violent movement side by side. The violent movement, nobody was pushed towards it, but it was the idea was that whoever wanted to give themselves fully to the nation should be given a chance to do so. And that was the beginning of the terrorist movement, which was later carried on by people like Subhash Bose. Now, as I said, Sri Aurobindo is coming to Bengal. This is all, all this we know from the political standpoint. 
But Sri Aurobindo's coming to Bengal was not something that was happening in a vacuum. This movement had been building for almost 60 years before that. Uh, great figures had written inspiring books. Uh, Bankim Chandra had written Bande Mataram, uh, sorry, uh, had written Ananda Mutt, in which the poem Bande Mataram is contained. Uh, Tagore was active at this time. All these people were very, very inspired. A number of other figures were very inspiring in creating a sense of national identity. But behind the surface, we have to see that there were very strong spiritual roots. This is one aspect of the Indian freedom movement which is glossed over by secular writers of Indian history. That the entire early nationalist period had a very, very strong spiritual orientation. And Bengal had a very, very rich tradition, a history, in particularly two kinds of traditions. One was Tantra and the other was Vaishnavism. So the Bhakti traditions that had been generated by Chaitanya and that were still very alive were being mobilized during the freedom movement. Even Bankim's writings draw heavily on both the Shakta as well as the Vaishnav traditions. Now the Shakta tradition was very powerful in, in Bengal and you might know that there is the idea of the sacralization of the entire subcontinent as the body of Shakti. So this is what is behind the idea of Bharat Mata that arises at this point. That Sati's <laughs> body has been you know, sacrificed and occupies all her parts are Shakti Pitas. It's like the sacred land of the Divine Mother. Now, so out of that comes the image of Bharat Mata. Bharat Mata was not just something that was espoused by a few people or only by Hindus. This was made a later kind of polit political, sort of politicized religious move. But at that point, Bharat Mata was completely espoused by the whole uh, Bengal uh, population. <coughs> this is the reason why during the Bangladesh struggle for freedom, idea of Bongo Mata arose again. This picture, by the way, by Abhinindranath Tagore, which was used in a political rally, and it's been named Bharat Mata, at that time was not called Bharat Mata, it was called Bongo Mata, Mother Bengal. Now, this was, in a way, translated into the national sphere, and then we start talking about Bharat Mata. But nevertheless, the idea is very interesting that at this point there was this kind of movement to treat the nation as the mother. That Now, we may say that that is something common to most countries. Patriotism tends to look at nations as the mother. Okay? Motherland, we have that very, except for Germany who talks about fatherland. Everybody else talks about motherland. But there is a difference, and it's important to note that difference. The difference comes from the fact that the Indian move to think of nation as mother has very strong spiritual traditions behind it. These people were actually practitioners of Tantra. They were, in, in, a, in an important letter that Sri Aurobindo writes he's, to his wife, he's talking about the fact that he, he's actually seen the land as the Divine Mother. So it's this kind of, uh, of, of politicization, in a, in a way subjective politicization of Indian traditions at the level of nationalism that is going on. And I think that's a very significant thing which shows the spiritual roots of Indian nationalism and politics. Now, so th this I bring out to show the, that Sri Aurobindo's movement towards yoga had very strong spiritual roots that were combined or braided with his move, need to see the na nation free, his, his ideas of freedom. Uh, they, they formed a little group of uh, revolutionaries and the revolutionaries had to take an oath with the Gita and the idea of doing nishkam karma, of doing work without any desire for the fruits was something that was central to the freedom movement at that point. 
Also, this, as I said, so the idea of the Gita and the idea of Tantra, these were very closely related. And so, the sacrifice of, of, of the self, complete sacrifice, all Indian spiritual traditions talk of sacrifice. And ultimately, the sacrifice is either the sacrifice of the sannyasi who leaves society, samsara, and goes out, or it is the sacrifice of the Gita, which is called Tyaga, which has to do with inner sacrifice of, 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 of desires. But Tantra takes it one step further and makes it also a physical sacrifice. In other words, I am ready to sacrifice my body. You see that sort of you know, sacrifice of body and soul for the divine. And I think that's what he was calling on them to uh, work on. Next please. Now, this period begins, so these, these are mental attitudes, these, this, these are disciplines which one might think of as nationalist, but at the same time that are truly spiritual, that are yogic, that are in a way going on in the people who are carrying out the freedom struggle. But along with it, Sri Aurobindo started moving towards the practice of actual spiritual disciplines particularly towards pranayama. So he, two years of pranayama, and partly the reason we have to look at that not only are these traditions being upheld, Sri Aurobindo came across some examples of sannyasis who had occult powers. And out of that he felt that by developing inner power, it was possible to have greater effect in the freedom struggle. So this is also very interesting because dispossessed people, people who don't have material power, people who don't have you know, political power, look for other sources of power and this is human power. It is in a way saying that it doesn't matter what you have, how many guns you have, how, many, how much money you have, how much support you have, I have something else, another dimension of power that is human power, spiritual power. By developing spiritual power, I can confront whatever other power you have. So that's how he begins. And, and it's important to realize that Sri Aurobindo's beginning in sadhana is not a seeking for moksha. It is a seeking for shakti. So there are tantric roots to the beginnings. And this should be understood. You know, that's why he starts looking for development of spiritual uh, force or power. But his pranayama practice at a certain point he dropped it. Didn't he, he felt that it, it wasn't going very far. So he dropped it. And he became very sick. And at this point he needed more help, spiritual help. So he asked his brother, uh, can you put me in contact with a yogi who will help me? His brother used to know at that time as I said this is a unwritten history of Indian politics that our Indian nationalism that uh, all these figures had gurus there were yogis and sannyasis who were moving around in their circles and they had close connections with people of that kind so his brother who was spearheading the terrorist movement used to know a yogi Maharashtran yogi by the name of Lele Vishnu Bhaskar Lele Lele lived in Baroda so he said, I'll put you in contact with Lele, why don't you make the occasion to meet him in Baroda? Now, such an occasion was coming up very quickly. As I said, freedom struggle at that point was dominated by what are called the moderates. They are the ones who wanted constitutional change, etc. But this faction, a uh, younger faction, faction led by people like Tilak and Aurobindo, they wanted Purna Swaraj and they, they were willing to take extreme steps to have it right now, you know, just right then. So the Tilak was actually for conciliation. He wanted to maintain the unity of all the, all the groups. It's actually Sri Aurobindo who took the decision that it's necessary for us to break from the moderates. We will, they'll be like a dead weight we'll have to carry all the time, the voice of negation. So if we want freedom for the nation, we have to break away from them. So there's a very important 
national movement. It's called the Surat Congress. So this happens in 1907. This Surat Congress was held there. You see a picture of that over here. What you, what you see here is the event just after the Surat Congress. In the Surat Congress, Sri Aurobindo had already planted the seeds so that there was a chaos and the breaking of the, of the two groups. The ex extremists and moderates parted company. And the moderates went their own way, the extremists had their own meeting, and this is the meeting that you're seeing there. You see uh, Tilak standing up, and you see Sri Aurobindo, he presided over that meeting, sitting at the chair. And so this very momentous event immediately catapulted all these figures into fame across the nation because people were waiting for a chance to say we want freedom and younger people were completely put on fire and what he didn't expect is that he became a hero overnight so when he moved he was, he was going to go from Surat to Baroda to meet this man Lele now, he had been in Baroda before so he had a home there where he was going to go and stay which is now the Sri Aurobindo Center, the Nivas in, in Baroda. So he went there and he was mobbed. It was, you know, the, you, can, you can think of the Beatles before their time. You know, the people just came rushing to the train station and they took out the horses from his chariot and put the chariot on their shoulders and huge numbers of people were carrying him. And he realized that this is not the best way to do sadhana. You know, I mean, you couldn't enter into the kind of meeting, encounter he wanted with this new guru that he was going to meet. So he went incognito, he left that home and went to a neighbor's one Majumdar's house and met with Lele there. And this is Vishnu Bhaskar Lele, the yogi that he met. This yogi was not uh, Advaitin. See, he was actually a Vaishnav of a certain kind. It's difficult to tell what kind. But from certain ways in which Sri Aurobindo speaks about the practices, he seems to be of a, a Bhagavat, of a, 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 a very old Vaishnav sect. Okay? He also be believed in Dattatriya, Dattatriya sort of cult. So he, they in their spiritual practice believed in opening the consciousness to receive Adesh from the Divine. They believed that the Divine was within everybody and you could hear the voice of God inside you. But to do that, you needed some silence first because there's so much going on inside us. There's so much confusion in our consciousness. So to bring a certain amount of inner silence, you need meditation. So in the, the, this uh, Lele's spiritual pursuit he taught Sri Aurobindo over there in that particular house. It's, it's worth envisaging the scene. This is one of those old Gujarati houses where there was a big swing in the middle of the room. The swing occupied almost the whole inside room. And the two of them sat on the swing. And Lele is instructing him on meditation, telling him a kind of Raja Yogic meditation in which you're supposed to watch your thoughts told him that thoughts don't originate in your mind they come from the outside so if you watch your thoughts you'll see each one coming and you can push it out before it comes now this idea was very outlandish he writes with his Western training to hear something like that was very outlandish he had never heard anything of that kind. But he said, I had decided to give complete, full opportunity to whatever I heard. So he said, I started looking. And he said, from the very get-go, I saw that thoughts were trying to come into my mind and I was throwing them out. And within the first few hours, within three hours, he felt silence of the mind and in a little while later he felt complete silence of the mind what is called nirvana in, in our traditions now this brought for him the unreality of the world 
he did not expect it because he was going to have to give a speech the next day, a political speech. He was supposed to travel from Baroda to Bombay the very next day to give two political speeches. And here he is experiencing the unreality of the world, the state that we call moksha. So he told this guru that I've lost all motivation. I have no motivation left. And the guru said, well, you have to give your talk, so you better go to Baroda, I'll come with you. So he got up with him on the train and went with him to Bombay. In Bombay, this condition continued. And from the house of his host, he looked outside and he saw everything he talks about, everything seeming like a dream, like, like not substantial. Everything was like a shadow. So he said, I can't give this talk because I have no motivation. I just cannot give this talk. I can't, nothing is going to come out. Freedom for the nation and all that is gone out of the window. So the Guru said, you just get up on that stage and fold your hands to Narayana because he was a Vaishnava after all, the Guru. He said, fold your hands to Narayana and he will talk from your mouth. So Sri Aurobindo says, he told him, I don't even have the motivation to fold my hands to Narayana. I mean, what are you telling me? So he said, well, go up on the stage. I will fold my hands to Narayana and you will give the speech. <laughs> <laughs> and then he records later that this is exactly what happened. He observed himself, or observed a speech coming out of his mouth. And this man was out there doing his prayers to Narayana. <laughs> So now he lived in that condition for a number of months. Everything was unreal to him. And we find that we'll see, we'll see what he looked at like at that point. But before that, I'd like to read you the poem that he wrote later in which he describes this condition. The poem is called Nirvana. It's written as a sonnet. All is abolished but the mute alone, the mind from thought released, the heart from grief, grow inexistent now beyond belief. There is no I, no nature, known, unknown. The city, a shadow picture without tone, floats, quivers unreal. Forms without relief flow a cinema's vacant shapes. Like a reef foundering in shoreless gulfs, the world is done. Only the illimitable permanent is here. A peace stupendous, featureless, still replaces all. What once was I in it, a silent, unnamed emptiness, content either to fade in the unknowable or thrill with the luminous seas of the infinite. So we find from this poem the basic features of the experience he's having. Everything has become unreal for him. His sense of self has disappeared. Only a witness is there. The witness is impersonal. There is no personality to it. Everything that it is watching is without substance. It's like it's watching a cinema. Just shapes are moving around without any particular substance to, to it. And whatever was the witness consciousness itself is provisional. It may stay, it may go. He doesn't know. It's there for a moment, it may disappear the next. Fade into the unknowable. So this is the condition in which he lived. But he notes later that activities continued. We have this tremendous sense of pride in our doership. You know, we are doers. And we feel that unless we, we're given some motivation, we won't do. But the fact is, as he points out, that nature has already molded us into an instrument. 
and other forces can use us, us without our sense of self. The Gita is talking about, in fact, this is in fact from a certain point of view the Gita's experience that he's living, that Prakriti is at work and he is only a witness watching the Prakriti at work in him, you know, just doing the works. Okay. So this is the experience he had. Now, the Guru at that point felt that this is not the kind of experience you wanted him to have because he evidently experienced something that was unpredictable to the Guru. Guru wanted him to come into contact with the Divine person, with Narayana. So at first he told him, the devil has got hold of you. Then later he said something inside him made him say, I have no more responsibility for you. I can't help you anymore. You will be guided from within. You only, an inner guidance will work in you. So he, from that point on, he started receiving guidance from an impersonal source. Something would guide him. He calls that source the master of the yoga. This term we come across in his diaries, the master of the yoga. No name given. In initially, there is no name. Later, he equates this with Krishna. More and more, gradually, this becomes Krishna for him. Next. Now, several months were spent in this condition. Freedom movement is going on. He lives in Calcutta. He is writing Bande Mataram. He is meeting people. He is directing. He is one of the leaders of the freedom struggle at that point. All this is going on. But he is not involved. The person is no longer there. Something else is working in him. In 1908, there is the famous bomb case, the terrorists, the group of terrorists who were not, not living with him. His brother was living in another place called Manitola, where they were making these bombs, etc. They threw the bombs at, some, at somebody and a couple of old ladies died. Not, a couple of English ladies died. Of course, the people who threw the bombs very famous, most of you who know anything about the freedom struggle know this, Prapullo Chaki and Khudiram Bose. These two people, they were finally accosted. Prapullo Chaki committed suicide. Khudiram Bose was hanged. And these people, they went to their that place where all these uh, terrorists were doing their things and, and raided that place. Overnight, the same day, they raided Sri Aurobindo's house, rounded up all these people, threw them in Alipur jail. Okay, this happens between 1908 and 1909. Now, this period, this about one year of incarceration, the whole sadhana of Sri Aurobindo intensified tremendously. And this condition of, uh, of, 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 of nirvana that he was living in started yielding to new experiences, new other experiences started filling it in. Uh, this picture, by the way, is a mug shot. Okay. This, this is what the British, the photo the British took when he was put in jail. There are two of them, this one and a full a front face. There were two photos taken during the... And here you can see that this is, this is the picture, that this is the post-Nirvana picture, when he, everything is unreal for him. He's least, you know, perturbed. He's going in with the, with the, you know, sort of capital punishment hanging over him as the most possible future. And that's the cell in which he was put, by the way, in Alipur jail. Uh, single, very small room. Uh, I've seen this room. <coughs> and uh, all he had was a little um, shelf on which he could sleep and a little alcove like that in which he could put a lamp. It looks surprisingly, in fact, like the cells in Ajanta. You know, Buddhist cells were exactly like this. A little room, a little, some piece of wood, um, I'm sorry, of, of, of rock that has been uh, carved out and a little space put with a, 
you know, ledge on which you can sleep and a little a niche in which you can put a lamp. So there he started having, at first he, he was wondering what he's doing over here. I mean, why was he put there? Because by this time he had completely surrendered his life to this presence, whoever was guiding him. And he asks, he's equating this with Krishna at this point, and he's asking, why have you brought me here? And there he starts having a number of experiences, many experiences. But of these experiences, there are three really important key fundamental experiences which pave the ground for everything else that is to come. One of them is that of what he calls the active Brahman. So this term, he uses this term to, in fact, distinguish it from the experience he had before this. The experience he had so far was that of a transcendental witness, something that to which the whole world was, was, was unreal, but something what he calls the illimitable permanent, a presence that is watching everything, but which is outside of everything. That is Brahman. But he talks about it as the passive Brahman, the Brahman that is, in fact, the Brahman talked about in Advaita Vedanta, Shankara's Brahman, passive. But in Tantra, they talk about another aspect of Brahman, they talk about Shakti. But Shakti also is nothing but Brahman. Shakti has become everything there is in this world. Brahman has become active and taken form as everything there is. So the unreality of the world, those figures, those shadows that he saw, now he saw them as the one substance becoming everything in the universe. That is the active Brahman, a universal Shakti that has become everything there is. And the third real powerful experience he had over the key experience he had over there was what he calls the Vasudeva Darshan. That is, not only has Brahman become everything there is in this universe <coughs> as a formulation of substance and energy, but a personal aspect of this Brahman exists inside everything. This is Vasudeva, this is Krishna, this is the Lord in the heart of things that the Gita is talking about. Where Krishna says, I am the Lord in the heart of all things, turning them as on a wheel. And Sri Aurobindo, after this phase, went to give, he, I mean, as you know, the, the, and then there, there's a third very important experience, but I'll come to that in a moment. So, these three key major experiences can be thought about in terms of different aspects of Brahma. And I'll get to that when we come to the next uh, screen. In fact, the whole Sanatan Dharma tradition, particularly all the Vedantic schools, are based on these three experiences, which they see differently and have broken up into different sampradayas and different forms of description of the divine, of Brahma. So I'll come to that in a moment. But after he came out of the jail, see, this was a very famous case. It took one full year. C.R. Das, the famous barrister, was the barrister for working for Sri Aurobindo. And, you know, at, in the beginning, he was giving him advice. He was giving C.R. Das, Chittaranjan Das advice. And then this same guide, guide from within him said to him, please stop giving him advice because he has better advice than you're giving him. I'm directly advising him. So he stops advising Chittaranjan Das, he keeps shut. And C.R. Das won the case for them at the end. One of the really interesting, uh, you know, trivia in this whole thing, maybe not so trivia, was that the judge, whose name was Beechcroft, was a colleague of Sri Aurobindo's in Cambridge. <laughs> and in fact, where he came first in the tripos in Greek and Latin. That judge came first in Sanskrit. <laughs> so many people say 
that he was a little biased. The, the, the British judge, but he was, he had a soft corner for this person, though he didn't know him then, there. But certainly he knew that he's from Cambridge of his same batch. So when he came out, he went to continue his nationalist activity. He went around giving talks. And very soon after he came out, he gave a very, very famous talk, the talk that is centrally connected with the term Sanatan Dharma. That was given at Uttarpara. This is called the Uttarpara speech. So from that very famous speech, which I think all of you should read, I mean, particularly Indians, all Indians should read that speech. Uh, I just want to read you one part, which has to do with the third experience, the Vasudeva experience. <clears throat> so he's saying, now he's in this speech, he's talking about him as Krishna, about the presence, the source, the master of the yoga, he's using the term Krishna. So he says, and when he uses the word he, that's what he means. He made me realize the central truth of the Hindu religion. He turned the hearts of my jailers to me, and they spoke to the Englishman in charge of the jail. He is suffering in his confinement. Let him at least walk outside his cell for half an hour in the morning and in the evening. So it was arranged. And it was while I was walking that his strength again entered into me. He suddenly felt filled in with the divine presence again. He was full of the strength of God. I looked at the jail that secluded me from men, and it was no longer by its high walls that I was imprisoned. No, it was Vasudeva who surrounded me. I walked under the branches of the tree in front of my cell, but it was not the tree. I knew it was Vasudeva, it was Sri Krishna, whom I saw standing there and holding over me his shade. I looked at the bars of my cell, the very grating that did duty for a door, and again I saw Vasudeva. It was Narayana who was guarding and standing sentry over me, or I lay on the coarse blankets that were given me for a couch, and felt the arms of Sri Krishna around me, the arms of my friend and lover. This was the first use of the deeper vision he gave me. So it's this Divya Drishti has opened up and he's actually seen, this is not just imagining, he's seen Krishna in everything. Sarvam Kaluvidam Brahman. But in this, that Brahman is Vasudeva. Vasudeva uh, I saw Vasudeva, it, it was... Um, this was the first use. I looked at the prisoners in the jail, the thieves, the murderers, the swindlers, and as I looked at them, I saw Vasudeva. It was Narayana whom I found in these darkened souls and misused bodies. When the case opened in the lower court and we were brought before the magistrate, I was followed by the same insight. He said to me, when you were cast in jail, did not your heart fail? And did you not cry out to me, where is thy protection? Look now at the magistrate, look at the prosecuting counsel. I looked, and it was not the magistrate whom I saw, it was Vasudeva, it was Narayana who was sitting there on the bench. I looked at the prosecuting counsel, and it was not the counsel for the prosecution that I saw, it was Sri Krishna who sat there, it was my lover and friend who sat there and smiled. Yeah, this is amazing in our age of materialism and science to read something like this. Coming from a Western trained person, this looks, reads like mythology. This looks like the story of Prahlad or something like that, that we read off and think that this is just, you know, very devotional people who are writing some kind of, you know, wish fulfillment stories. But this is going on in the actual experience of somebody who was completely trained in Western science and materialism, who had a tremendous amount of skepticism, he calls himself an atheist to start with, and who's having pratyaksha drishti, this is actual sight, he's looking at things, not imagining things. So this is 
the third experience, very important experience. Now the point I want to make is that these three experiences we talked about, the experience of nirvana, the experience of shakti, and the experience of Krishna, they belong to completely different Indian traditions. These traditions don't want to acknowledge the existence of the other. The, the Advaitins don't have anything to do with, with the Vaishnavs. And the worst thing you can say to a Vaishnav is that the world is all Maya. That's probably one of the worst things you can say to them. Or that Brahman is impersonal. But he had these three experiences. The question is, how to integrate them? Where can you say is the single thing that unites these? And we don't ask this question. This is one of the things about the Indian tradition. These things have been allowed to coexist. There are two approaches to this kind of diversity. One of them is the attitude of the mystic, which is the best example of that is Sri Ramakrishna, I would say. A mystic like Sri Ramakrishna would not ask the question at all what unites these. He would experience them. It's, he would say that the divine is illimitable, infinite, innumerable, and can be experienced in infinite ways. We cannot define or limit the experiences of the divine. To have these three totally different kinds of experiences means nothing as far as experience of God is concerned. Because God is illimitable. But the second approach, which also India has a very strong tradition is, is the philosophical approach. How can we put it into reasonable terms? How can we understand it? Because there is a way, there is a, this idea or even the idea of Sanatana Dharma is ultimately to look for a single thing. What is the one thing that unites all of these things? So the darshans that we have seen, all the Vedantic darshans, are each of them a certain attempt to explain that one thing there is. And they do it either by ignoring the other ways or by subjecting the other ways, reducing them to aspects of their selves. Okay? Brahma, Satya, Jagan, Mithya. The Vaishnavas say, Brahman exists, but it is only the aura of Krishna. See, his impersonal aura is what people call Brahman. But at the heart of the creation is the person, the single person Krishna. See? The Tantrics say that Brahman as, in a, as an impersonal being who is transcendental is completely secondary to Shakti. Shakti is what Shiva is Shava if not for Shakti. And all of them have a point. There is a truth to every one of these darshans. Now, I'd like to come to the next very important <coughs> experience that Sri Aurobindo had in the Alipur jail. This is not talked about that much, but it is very significant. Or it is talked about in terms of miracles, but I think philosophically it is the key thing that happened to him. He was visited by the spirit of Vivekananda in the jail. And you know, he talks, I mean, Sri Aurobindo was very, he was like a scientist, and you can see that in that book, in the record of yoga. He really probes every experience and gets, you know, like the objective facts of each of these, tests them to, to the least detail. So he even at one point says that maybe it was not Vivekananda, maybe it was one of my own higher personalities impersonating as Vivekananda in one conversation. But he came to believe gradually by the evidence of his own experience that it was Vivekananda. That it was Vivekananda, he did not see him. He says that, that, that also he writes, he says, I did not see him. I felt him as a presence and I heard his voice. But he made himself unmistakably known to me. This is Vivekananda. And he showed him 
that there are ranges of mind above what we have experienced as human beings. That whatever we call mind has got another other gradations of cosmic mind above it that have not yet evolved just as we find in the world and evolution. We find creatures that exp express consciousness in different modalities. Plants express plant consciousness. Animals express a sl slightly greater quantum of consciousness. Human beings express mental consciousness to a much greater extent so that we can understand ideas that are cosmic. But there are further realms of mind consciousness that have not yet evolved in human beings. And human beings are still unfinished product. And when people talk about spiritual experience, to some extent they reach these extraordinary conditions in extraordinary spiritual states. That is in trance or in some kind of very extreme condition like in his own case everything becomes unreal or everything is replaced by the presence of Krishna. So the way by which one can bridge all these experiences and experience something which is simultaneously the same is by integrating these higher cosmic ranges of mind and reaching what he called supermind. Supermind was a consciousness in which we find the knowledge of God as he knows himself. See, this is very important because again we come back to the question of how to integrate these different modalities of divine experience. Are we to take it like the mystic that we can never integrate them, they all exist, these are many ways in which God comes to us or is there a single way by which we can know them? Another way of putting it would be, can we know God as God knows himself? Okay. Now, we can think about human consciousness. This becomes very clear if we realize the fact that we are assuming that we as human beings have some capacity to know the divine as the divine knows himself. It's just like saying that, well, the dog pet that you have often looks at you in wonder because it feels that you're a kind of being that is very different from it. You, if you're really sensitive, you will feel, if you have a pet, you will feel that these creatures aspire to know you. They feel something alien and very, very, you know, advanced. Yet at the same time, they feel that there is something very similar. That similar thing is what unites us all. It is that common substratum of divinity in all things. Yet, everything is evolved to a different degree. So the dog, if it tries to, if it had the power of conceptualization, would think of you as a super dog. It would not be able to really grasp the kind of consciousness that humanity has. So too, human beings in our approach to God actually make God into a superhuman. Certain capacities that we have, we project on God and we have some true divine experiences. I'm not saying, nor is Sri Aurobindo saying, that the great sages who have gone before him did not have true divine experience. They did. But that experience was in ways which were already under the lens of mind. That's why there was an exclusivity to them. Let's move to the next. Now, I want to come fast forward to our own times and talk about a very important thinker in religious studies in the academy right now. His name is Robert Foreman. He is what one might say a perennial, what one might call a perennialist. So we come back to the idea of perennial philosophy which is a translation of the term Sanatan Dharma. It rises, you know, term perennial philosophy has its own history and it's only from the turn of the 1920th century that this term actually becomes integrated with Indian philosophy, with Vedanta. 
And part of the reason that happens, very important player in that game is Vivekananda. Vivekananda's speech in Chicago, 1893, with which we started this talk, uh, made a tremendous dent. And after that, a number of figures, people like Aldous Huxley, who wrote a very important book <coughs> called The Perennial Philosophy, started seeing this idea of perennialism in Vedantic terms. And so the question became, the big, big question, the central question of Vedanta is, if you want to reduce Vedanta to one single Mahavakya, that there is nothing but Brahman. It is that single, there is only one thing, and that, that is Brahman, that exists. Now, that is the root of Sanatan, that is the root of perennialism. The question is that how then are we to explain these different experiences of God that people have? How are we to experience, explain the different Vedantic Sampradayas? Keval Advaita, Vishisht Advaita, Dvaita, Achintya Bheda Bheda. These are all Vedantic Darshans. Each one is completely different from the other and actually doesn't believe in the other. So how are we to say what unites them? So Foreman, Robert Foreman has proposed that ultimately you can reduce all God experience to three kinds of God experience. And these are all ways by which we can due to our human limitations, being human beings, not being God, God can come to us in these three ways. Yet, what comes to us is the same thing. So we can experience different types of experiences, but it is really the same thing that comes to us. He talks about them, his three, three uh, kinds of divine darshan, nihilism, monism and dualism. Now, these terms have popular meanings, but he is using them in a very special way. Nihilism does not mean nothing exists. Nihilism in Foreman's use of the term refers to Buddhism. It refers to a transcendentalism. In other words, by nihilism he means that God is infinite beyond every possible conception that we can have of that reality. So the Buddhists, they want to get to that. When they talk about Nirvana, they're basically making a principled denial of description for the divine. We don't want to say what it is, because if we say it, it's not that. So ultimately, we experience something which we can only say is beyond any possible description. So, nihilism is actually the experience of the unmanifest transcendental. If God is truly infinite, then there is infinite amount of God that will always be unmanifest. See, this, is the, this is the mathematics of infinity. Purnam, you see, Purnam, Purnasya Purnam Adaya, Purnam Eva Vashishyate. You can take infinite from infinite, Infinite only will remain. So, yeah, from Isha Basim. So, nihilism is that there is always infinite unmanifest, will never be manifest, right? Whatever we can talk about beyond that. That is a new kind of nihilism. That is experienced in Turiya condition. See, that is the, the trance beyond everything. Buddhism is one of the sort of philosophies that approaches that, or talks like that. Then there is pure monism. Monism has two aspects. Pure monism, which is talking about a transcendental reality outside what we know in our own existence. We call it Satchidananda. Experience of Satchidananda is pure monism. It is experienced in condition of Shushupti which is a trance outside our objective and subjective conditions. Subjective condition is a condition of dream. Go beyond all possible dreams and you come to a layer of purity, which is pure monism or Advaita. Qualified monism, which is called Vishisht Advaita, 
has to do with an understanding of the occult world behind our words. There are many other worlds and many other forces. Those forces are making everything here happen. You and I are just a conglomeration of forces. We seem to be something very real, but we are just held together for this life. And once the balance of the forces is disturbed, we fall into pure matter and we are gone. See? Only what remains is the spark, divine spark that never goes anywhere. See? So that is Shakti schools, Tantra, as well as the Vaishnav schools of Ramanuja, okay, Vishishtadvaita, believe in that kind of, Vishishtadvaita actually believes there is only one Brahman. We cannot know it outside of its phenomena. All phenomena are expressions of Brahman. We only know it through the phenomena. And finally, there is dualism, which has to do with the bhakti schools. That is at the individual level, that is what he called Vasudeva Darshan. God is inside every one of us. And we can experience it in the Jagrat, in other words, waking condition, we can, we can say that every, everything is full of divine. We can say it. Can we experience it? It takes a very high level of achievement to experience it, like the Vasudev Darshan, which he was seeing with his eyes open. That is Dvaita. So these are the three main uh, pillars of perennialism, according to Paul. Now, as we said, each one of these is exclusive, exclusive when experienced through the mind, but integral in supermind. In other words, if one can reach a certain consciousness, one can see God as all these things at the same time. Now, when Sri Aurobindo had his experience, he was experiencing them separately. And he was having a tough time integrating them. Because he's got long passages in the record of yoga, where he's talking about specifically meditating on each of these aspects and trying to maintain one while having the other. And it's only when he rises to conditions that he calls supramental that he can have them simultaneously, all at once. So this is the, the darshan that Sri Aurobindo received before he went to Pondicherry. That's why I said all that I'm going to talk about has to do before he went to Pondicherry. At the end of that period, he got, he was again in Calcutta after the jail uh, experience. He was again going to be, you see what happened, then there's all this correspondence that has now come to light that they had dubbed him, the British had dubbed him the most dangerous man in India. This was how they knew him. And they wanted him out. They wanted to get him out to England and put him in a prison somewhere there. And that's what they, they wanted to you know, expel him and so they were trying to catch him again on some ground and get him out of the country. So one fine day, some people came and said that he's going to be raided again and they would put him in jail and send him out of the country. And they were talking about what he should do, how he should hide and all that. And he says he heard a clear voice from that source, from the master of the yoga. And people asked him, Can't you, wouldn't, couldn't you be mistaken? And he said, once you've heard that voice, you can't be mistaken. And it said to him, go to Chandranagore, which was a French uh, colony close to Calcutta. He immediately walked to the, uh, the office in which he was at that time, was close to the ghat. He, with two, three people, he walked to the Ganga ghat and hailed a ferry. A boat, boatman was, happened to be around. He hailed them got onto the boat and went off to Chandranagar. There he lived at the house of another revolutionary, Motilal Roy, for a, for a few months. And then one fine day he got another Adesh. He said, go to Pondicherry. He got, then there's this long rigmarole of how he managed to escape the, under false name and all that. He got to Pondicherry. And then of course, as you know, he stayed there for the rest of his life. But it's only after that that he starts maintaining these diaries. And so all the things we've talked about, 
in these diaries, he is regularizing these experiences. He's been given a program how to integrate these experiences and make them integral in his consciousness. That is the basis of what is called the integral yoga of Sri Aurobindo. Next, please. So, I want to now round up last part of this talk. What are Sri Aurobindo's contributions? What can we say are Sri Aurobindo's contributions? This is my way of putting it. The first real contribution of Sri Aurobindo is to point out that spirituality is evolutionary. It is not static. It is not that we can point to some point in time and say everything was said at that time. You know, God is constantly revealing himself to us and we are constantly becoming more capable of receiving new revelations. There is a two-way evolution going on. So spirituality itself is evolutionary. We can see that through the history of spiritual landmarks in Indian uh, philosophy. The Veda gives us the idea of yajna or the law of sacrifice. The divine, the Purusha Sukta is perhaps the central pillar of the Veda. It talks about the sacrifice of Purusha. Purusha has become everything there is by dismembering himself. We are all the members, dismembered members of Purusha. Our duty is to reconstitute, remember Purusha. And that remembrance of Purusha is ultimately done through the reverse sacrifice. We sacrifice back. Yachna, the divine's yachna is returned by our yachna. This is the occult message, secret message of the Veda that Sri Aurobindo teaches. <coughs> Vedanta gives us the idea of Brahman. There is nothing but Brahman. Identity with the transcendental being. So this is the new message. You don't need priests. You don't need rituals. You don't need esoteric uh, sects. Everybody can experience the one thing there is because that is inside us. Atman and Brahman are one. Gita gives us the idea of avatar, which did not exist before that. This is very significant. Idea of avatar is again an integral idea. Gita is an integral document. It gives us, the, it unites the three yogas of knowledge, works, and, and bhakti. And it gives us the idea of Krishna as an embodiment of the divine, a person who unites everything. Again, this we go back to, can we know God as God knows himself? The Gita is saying, yes, there is a kind of knowledge that can be called God's knowledge of himself. It gives us that in the Vishwarupa. The Vishwarupa is completely incomprehensible to Arjuna. Arjuna says, stop, I can't bear it anymore. Show me your universal form. Why? Because man hasn't reached that state. But Gita tells us it is possible. There is a certain state which can be called integral state. Puranas show us the reality of puja, which is relations with Brahman through the cosmic gods. Cosmic gods are embodiments of Brahman and we can relate to them according to our Swadharma. Each person has a different kind of innate capacity and innate attraction. Follow your own Swadharma. Go to the God that you like. Same divine will come to you through that. That is the whole idea of Purana. Tantra gives us the idea of Siddhi, which is identity with the powers of God. God is full of bhagas, you know, divine capacities, powers, and we can equate with them. We can be full of that power of God. Chaitanya gives us the notion of prema, that is, divine love, that everything ultimately is filled with love. And that's why we see Sri Aurobindo invoking the Indian, the Bengali tradition of bhakti in his Uttarpara speech when he is talking about Krishna as his lover, okay, his lover's arms, my lover's arms were around me. Okay. And that is the whole bhakti movement. Which I'm just using Chaitanya's name, but 16th century is full of bhakti movement in India. It's, it's a new revelation. Ramakrishna gives us the idea of world religions. 
and a creative spirituality. This is the new definition of Sanatan Dharma. That we can attain God through every way possible. Jato mot tato pot. You find your way to God. God is waiting for you at the other end. This creative, creative spirituality. Every religion can be made a means. Doesn't matter what their doctrine says. But it can be made a means to experience the divine. Sri Aurobindo gives us the notion of a divine life based on the supramental manifestation. Okay. Now, what does that mean? That means, again, going back to what I said, that there is yet a stage to come, a stage in the evolution of mankind. And to understand what that is like, perhaps it's best to think of it like this, that now, with all our spiritual history, individuals can go to caves, go to monasteries, or even practice in their daily life some discipline towards union with God. We'll have an experience of God. But our experience of God will be individual. I will know that God exists. I may even know that God exists in all things. I may then know that God is the one thing there is. But it will not change anything in the world. See, things will remain exactly like they are. But if we can think of a condition in which all of us here experience simultaneously that we are the one, that is a different modality of existence. We are all limbs of the one being. We know each other because we are each other. We are not trying to guess who each other is. We are each other because there is nothing but God and we all know it together. That is a different kind of species. It's a species of the same. Just as animals cannot understand what the manifestation of mind is like in human beings, we cannot understand what the manifestation of super mind is like in the supramental being. But that is what it is like. It is like the simultaneous knowledge of God by identity in the collective. So we all know it together. Now what can we do about it? Is it something that we have to wait for God to unveil? And Sri Aurobindo says, no. This transition is different. It has to be achieved by us. We have to get there by power of yoga. Next please. This is the next contribution of Sri Aurobindo. Not only spirituality is evolutionary, nature is evolutionary. What we call avidya, the condition of separateness, the condition of ignorance, is a temporary cosmic condition. Because ultimately there will only be the knowledge of the one. So we will all know that the one exists, it alone exists, collectively, not in a kind of a individual way. Prakriti or nature has evolved matter, life and mind. Supermind is the next phase of nature's evolution. So nature is evolving. But at this point, that, that next step is to be achieved by us through yoga, but needs yoga to accomplish it. How can we prepare ourselves for it? This is Sri Aurobindo's message to mankind in a way today because maybe not everybody can undertake the strenuous yoga that he himself did. But we can all take our steps towards it. The first is the ideal of human unity. This is a book that he has written. But essentially what he's saying is that all human beings are evolving at this point towards a condition where they should be able to understand each other beyond their differences, beyond their cultural differences, beyond their religious differences, beyond their political differences. So he's envisaging a working from the individual level towards a world culture, a world religion, and a world government. How can we do that? We have to expand our experiencing capacity. In our minds, we have to expand our minds to understand others. In our hearts, we have to expand to understand the other. 
in our being, it, every form of experience, we have to surpass ourselves to become universal. The second preparation is the ideal of a spiritual life. This is almost still to come, but it is knocking on the door, as it were. He's saying that more and more people should feel the need that the solutions for the problems of mankind cannot be achieved except through God-realization. That whatever political solutions, scientific or technological solutions, other kinds of engineering solutions we try, it's really a tinkering with the instrument. Well, what we really need is a change of the consciousness. The change of consciousness has to come from yoga, from doing the, That's the reason why he went to Pondicherry and did not leave for the rest of his life you know, though he could have given great messages to the nation, to others which were political, number of political figures came and asked him to go back and take the leadership of national politics. And he said, if I were to go back now, I'd be like the blind leading the blind. What I want to establish is a way by which consciousness can actually remove its blinders. We can become fully conscious. So this is the work that he did. What is India's contribution to this? India's real contribution to the world is yoga. This is the real message that India has. We have to live it, we have to experience it, we have to be examples of it. Not just talk about it, not open Sanatan Dharma temples where we will say that people should do this or people did do that. We have to do it ourselves. We have to be that example. And it has to be an integral approach to yoga. Not one sect or another sect. Not the rule of the sannyasis anymore. It is the Grihastha yogis who have to do it. In our everyday life we have to do it. And there are four goals. Bhakti, Mukti, Shakti and Bhukti. These are the four goals of the new yoga that he talks about. Bhakti, love and devotion, surrender to the divine, divine being, in all our acts, at all our times. The constant presence of the divine in our actions should be there. Mukti, we have to find a consciousness which is free of everything. Something unborn is inside us. That infinitely unmanifest, that is always infinite. We have to find that in our everyday life. Shakti, we have to increase the power that is inside us so that we become powerful instruments of the divine. Okay, we are here as instruments of the divine, not as people who will leave the world to its own uh, devices, but Arjunas in the world. See, we have to be the channel through which God can work. And bhukti, enjoyment, is nothing other than the realization of these three. The enjoyment of bhakti, the enjoyment of mukti, the enjoyment of shakti, that is bhukti. Tantric realization of bhukti is ultimately this. These are the three forms of legitimate enjoyment that gives us God enjoyment. Next, last, uh, last. So, Final contribution of Sri Aurobindo, all life is yoga. Nature is doing yoga even before humankind has appeared. Nature itself is evolving greater and greater powers of divinity and ultimately will evolve God on earth. So Prakriti's evolution has reached a certain point with the human being now, which is a very, very important point. That's why Sri Aurobindo says, we are at a critical stage in our evolution. And even beyond Sri Aurobindo's own life, we can see it in our own times. If we think of the integration and the universalization of mind. Today, there is a universal <coughs> mind that is materializing itself. We can see that in the internet. See, we can find information of any kind and it will only increase 
so that it's almost like an externalized cosmic mind that any of us can tap into. This is happening without our volition. No one person can claim that they are behind it. This is part of the supramental evolution that is taking place. It will end up in a stage where mind, universal mind will be, the whole history of mankind will be at everybody's, uh, you know, uh, not really fingertip, but access. Okay? But there is a problem with that, very big problem. That is, an externalized cosmic mind says nothing about the dwarfing of human personality. See, we still are like extremely infant creatures. And in fact, huge machineries like internet are being used to control us and keep us even smaller, really extremely anonymous. We become more like numbers, statistical game of numbers, anonymous. So the other kind of evolution, which has been really downplayed in our times, is necessary. And that's where India's message really needs to kick in. That is soul's evolution. Purusha's evolution, not only Prakriti's evolution, which is going on by itself, but Purusha's evolution, which is in you, me, all of us, the individual has to claim its right. We have to become cosmic ourselves. Cosmic mind, not only outside, cosmic mind inside. See? How is that done? That, of course, is the entire scheme of the integral yoga, the integration of the mind, life and body around the soul, which is done through the bringing to the front of that element that we talked about in Sri Aurobindo's own life, the immanent divine, the divine who is within, active surrender to Ishwara and Shakti, which is Bhakti, silence of the mind and development of intuition, because <coughs> of the realms of cosmic mind above, and we have to find this, the one Brahman, we have to develop silence of the mind, that is mukti. We have to extend our human capacities, shakti. We have to integrate the cosmic mind ranges and become cosmic ourselves, transformation of the nature. And we have to rise to supermind and from that level cause the descent of supermind. Now, these last things are perhaps too far beyond our present capacity. We can take the first steps. But if we are to believe Sri Aurobindo, Sri Aurobindo and his spiritual collaborator, the mother, took these steps. And that power that we call supermind is active today in the earth atmosphere. What that means, we cannot say. Sri Aurobindo himself would not say. When he was asked, what does that mean? What is it going to do? He said, when it comes down, let it decide for itself. But one thing we can say is that help is there for whoever wants to take even the least step in this direction. There is a help that they will get. I think with that I'll stop. And anybody has any questions, we'll be happy.